Would you open your Bibles to Psalm 31? We'll look at a few verses from Psalm 31 this morning. Before we read God's Word together, let's pray. Almighty God, our Father in Heaven, we're so thankful at this time for your Word, which guides us in uncertain times. Father, we need your direction in life, and we're so happy that you revealed your mind to us, and there's truth and power in your Word. Help us to listen with reverence and to obey your word and receive your blessings and have faith and trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Today we want to talk about providence, which, uh, to put it maybe a little simply, is God's ability to bring everything together to accomplish his purpose. Now, in the psalm that Brent read, or at least a portion of it, David shows us what it's like for somebody to really believe in God's providence and to go through the trials of life believing in God's providence. His life, just like yours and mine, was full of change and adversity, but he committed his fragile existence to the unchanging hand of God. Did you see that in verse 5? He said, into your hand I commit my spirit. Much like Jesus, who suffered innocently, as Austin said from 1 Peter chapter 2, he kept entrusting his soul to a faithful creator while doing good. He, in the midst of, of David's distress, he declared with this childlike faith in verse 15, my times are in your hand. I've been waiting to preach this sermon for a long time, particularly because, for years, because of that phrase. That is a beautiful phrase. My times are in your hand. Now, what does that mean? I think when David talks about times, plural, he's not just talking about our, our lifespan. He's talking about the variety of trials and problems that we face throughout life, all the ups and downs, all the twists and turns. David says, I commit all that to you. All of my times are in your hand, the good, the bad, everything in between. Now, this particular time for David was extremely challenging. If you just scan verses 9 to 13 there, David is exhausted from stress, from grief. David feels isolated and intimidated by his enemies, but believing in a God who provides and protects and guides helps him navigate this crisis by faith. So what does it mean to believe in a God who provides for his people? Well, let's just start with a couple of things. First of all, it means that we're not fatalists. We don't believe that we're trapped in the grip of blind, predetermined forces. Providence doesn't mean that our destiny is ruled by fate, an impersonal fate. Do you remember the time when the Apostle Paul went to Athens in Greece? And he saw all these different idols and he went to proclaim to them uh, this unknown God, the God that they were ignorant of? Well, he ran into several different kinds of philosophers there. And one of the philosophers, they were Stoics. And they believed in a merciless system of unalterable fate. Fatalism, fatalism says that because everything is predetermined, instead of struggling against this blind force, we should just accept things with a spirit of resignation. Que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. But that's not the providence of God. The providence of God is different because he gives us the free will to serve Him. And when we commit our times, when we commit our life to God and serving God, we can say with David, my times are in your hand. Or as he says in another, in another psalm, you hem me in behind and before, you lay your hand upon me. 
Now, God's hand, the beautiful thing about it is He doesn't force our choices. Rather, when we choose to serve Him, when we choose to make our will His will, His hand will be there to comfort us. His hand will be there to guide us, to protect us, and to deliver us. And I rejoice, and we ought to rejoice, that the universe is governed by a personal, loving, wise, powerful, good God who has a plan rather than some blind, inflexible, impersonal, predetermined force. So we're not fatalists, and nor are we hedonists, like ships tossed about on the sea of chance. The other group of philosophers that Paul ran into in Athens were Epicureans, and they believed that the gods had just given up on the world, and everything now happens by chance. So we're just sort of left on our own, and it's not fate, but it's luck. It's random fortune. And since there's no existence before birth and there's nothing after death, well then let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Therefore, in a random world, the greatest good is what brings the greatest amount of pleasure. That's what these people believed. But think about that. This view turns our free will into a kind of prison. There was a French philosopher, Jean-Paul Sartre, who said, we are left alone. Listen to this worldview. We are left alone, without cause, condemned to be free. Man is born without reason, prolongs itself out of weakness, and dies by chance. Not someone that you'd want to have a cup of coffee with. This nihilistic view, it turns us into hedonists, essentially, where the goal of life is just getting as much pleasure as you can before the light goes out. And so the attitude is carpe diem. It sees the day. The nihilist says there's nothing yesterday and there's nothing tomorrow, so do what you want today. But Jesus comes and says, Today matters. The choices you make today matter because of what God has done for you in the past and because of what God promises to do in the future. You have a God who loves you. You have a God who provides for you. You have a God who's given you instruction and wisdom. Choose to serve him today because judgment is coming. So our lives are not the result of random chance with only black non-existence in the future. Our lives matter because we're accountable to a loving and providential God. Well, enough of the negative. What are we? Well, we're Christians, and we're being trained in the school of God's providence. We do not believe in blind fate. We do not believe in mere luck or fortune. We believe in a God who is in control of things. And there are many passages we can turn to but I think the one that clearest explains providence is Romans 8 and verse 28. Paul says there, We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Now notice he begins here with the phrase, we know. And I rather like that because there's a lot of stuff we don't know, right? especially when we're thinking about providence and just how life just seems so topsy-turvy all the time, we don't know so much. And in those areas that we don't know, where God has not plainly revealed his mind to us, we've got to respect that silence. We've got to just trust him, right? The secret things belong to God, but the things that he's revealed belong to us. Moses said long ago in Deuteronomy 29 and verse 29, but notice Paul lists four truths here about God's providence that we know. What do we know for sure? Well, first of all, we know that God works. That is, He is at work. He is at work in the world. He's at work in our lives. God is not asleep. He's not aloof. He's not unaware. He's not unwilling to get involved. He is ceaselessly, energetically, purposefully active even when we can't see it. And it's vital that we believe that. There are times in our life when we're not going to see God working. Just because you can't see God working doesn't mean he's not working. Have you ever read the book of Esther? 
God isn't mentioned in that entire book, and yet God's hand is all over the events in that book, guiding things, providing for his people. He has a plan. He is working. So that's the first thing. God is working. We know, second of all, that God works for good. Because God himself is good, therefore all that he does is good, and ultimately for the good of his people. Now, in Romans 8, I know we're lifting this out of its context, but if you were to continue reading in Romans 8, 29 and 30, the goal of God's good work is our salvation, is to conform us to the image of his Son, and so that we can be justified and we can be glorified. So God is not necessarily at work for your comfort. And that's another vital truth. He is at work for your good, our ultimate good, our supreme good. And the next point highlights this. We know that God works for good in all things, even bad things. He's at work for your good. Like suffering, like trials, loss, even when you endure pain, God is at work for good in all things. As we mentioned this morning, He can incorporate even evil things into the scope of His providence so that all things, even if they are negative now, can have a positive uh, result in the execution of His plan. But we can't skip this last one, and it might be the most important, because Paul qualifies his statement here. He puts a limit on what he says. We know God works. We know God works for good. We know God works for good in all things. For who? For those who love him. For those who are called according to his purpose. What does this tell us? Well, he's not saying that, he's not expressing this general superficial optimism that everything leads to everyone's good all the time, no matter what. No. If the good which is God's objective is our salvation, then those who benefit are only those who love God, whom he describes as those who are called according to his purpose, to be conformed to the image of Christ and ultimately to be saved. So we don't always know. We don't always understand what God is doing. But we can know that he's working. We can know that he's working for good in every situation to those who have given their lives to him to those who have responded to his love by loving him in return. And so the real question is, do you love him? And how do we show that we love God? We show that we love God by understanding his love for us. And we exhibit that in our obedience to his commands, right? If you love me, you will keep my commandments, as Jesus says. So are you willing to trust God? Are you willing to commit your times into his hand, to commit your spirit into his hand? Are you willing to trust his good purposes? When we surrender our will to his and when we serve him in faith, we might not know about everything that's going on right in the middle, right, of the storm and the, and the craziness of life, but we're being trained in the school of God's providence. Just like clay being shaped by a potter, one experience at a time, to look more and more like Jesus. Well, what are the implications of committing our times into God's hand? Let's talk about three. First of all, believing in God's providence and committing ourselves to trusting Him means that prosperity should never be the occasion for pride. Prosperity should never be the occasion for pride. Just because God grants us free will to choose, it doesn't make us the source of blessing, right? The farmer, he's got to do his work. He's got to till the field, prepare the soil. He's got to wisely plant at the right time. But can he make the sunshine? Can he make the rainfall? No, only God can cause the increase. And God wanted to remind this to Israel before they came into the promised land. When you live in these houses that you haven't built, when you till those fields you haven't planted and all this stuff, don't forget, God is the one who gave you the ability to get wealth. So don't get high and mighty. Don't think that you're something. God is the source. 
of all of our blessings. So any gift, any blessing, any abundance we possess comes from above. I'm reminded of Joseph, you know, when uh, Joseph was given the ability by God to interpret dreams. Do you remember this in the book of Genesis? And Joseph is languishing in prison, forgotten it seems. And then suddenly the servant of Pharaoh, Pharaoh has this terrible dream and the servant Aha, I remember Joseph. He was the guy who interprets dreams. And so he's called out of prison and he's brought before the king. And Pharaoh says, Joseph, give me this interpretation. And Joseph essentially says, it's not me, right? God will give Pharaoh a favorable interpretation. He didn't say, yeah, I'm your guy. I'm great at dreams. No, no, God gave me this ability. Same thing with David, young David, right? When he comes out to meet Goliath. Goliath's, you know, screaming all these terrible things about God and his people. And David doesn't say, my name's David, and I'm going to chop your head off. You know? He didn't say that. He says, you come to me with all these implements of war. I come to you in the name of the Lord. And he defeats him because of his humility, because of his dependence upon God, his faith. So prosperity should never be the occasion for pride. Providence should teach us humility. Secondly, uncertainty. I think maybe this is the hardest thing. Uncertainty should never be the occasion for panic. The Lord knows we are prone to worry. Jesus talks about this extensively in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. The people of the kingdom are not anxious about having their needs met because they believe in a God who will provide for them. Right? But the Gentiles, the pagans, who don't have that faith, they wear themselves out with worry, not knowing that God will provide what they need. And so what does Jesus say at the end of this, Matthew chapter 6? He tells them to put their priorities in order. He says in verse 33, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. God has given you energy and resources to deal with the problems of today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Believe in a God who will provide for you. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So we experience panic, anxiety, and fear because of the uncertainty of the future. We're not there. We can't see it. And we're always a step away from disappointment and danger, even death. But we can bring all those fears to a God who is in control. And we can say with David, my times are in your hand, in your capable hand. You've proven it over and over and over again. Could I share with you a, a, a song that captures this in poetic form? And it's really helped me as a Christian. Be still, my soul, the Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide. In every change, he faithful will remain. Be still, my soul. Thy God doth undertake to guide the future as he has the past. Has God guided the past? Do we have examples of that? Sure we do. He will then surely guide the future as well. Thy hope, thy confidence, let nothing shake. All now mysterious shall be bright at last. Be still, my soul. Thy best, thy heavenly friend, through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. Be still, my soul, the waves and winds still know his voice who ruled them while he dwelt below. Or maybe you like John Newton's hymn better. Through many dangers, toils, and snares I have already come. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. So God's providence teaches us peace. It gives us a peace which passes all understanding, where we can not have to be anxious about anything, but we can go to God in prayer about everything. And we can receive that peace which will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And then thirdly, adversity should never be the occasion for impatience. It's easier said than done. But adversity should never be the occasion for impatience. Believing in providence means we're not surprised when hard times come. We endure suffering knowing that even the evil we experience is not outside the scope of God's control. 
Because he's good, because he's all-powerful, he can turn even the worst, ugliest things into the best, most beautiful things. And again, we point to the cross to see this where God turned the very worst of human and spiritual evil into the greatest blessing and the greatest victory of all time. So knowing about God's providence, it gives us a kind of perspective that those thorny ways do lead to a joyful end, that through the cross and the grave came vindication, resurrection, came life, came victory, that through the darkness God will draw us into his light. So providence provides perspective. And when we have perspective, when we know that the pain is going to end, well, that helps us endure, doesn't it? I remember when I broke my leg in high school, vivid pain. Uh, And I just remember sitting there and just thinking, it's okay, I know that this is going to eventually end. I know I'm going to get better. And we need to take that view, you know, and just sort of stretch it out over our whole life, right? I know this is kind of terrible right now, but God is going to see me through. and He's got an answer in the judgment coming where he's going to do away with all evil and he's going to bring us into his marvelous light and into victory. I think another helpful passage here is James 5. James talking to suffering Christians. And he says, As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. So when we've got the long view, when we've got that perspective of faith, and we know we've seen the purpose of the Lord, then we can endure anything, right? Because we know it is going to turn out right if we remain faithful to Him. We see how the lives of others who were faithful how they suffered faithfully. We see how their stories turned out. And that helps us get through our lives with patience and faith. He talks about the prophets. Read some of these prophets. They were proclaiming God's word faithfully. Did they get a pat on the back? Did they get a thank you from Israel? No. They were rejected. They were scorned. They were maligned. They were persecuted. Some of them even died. But they've all gone on to their heavenly reward. Precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints. Think of David. Read 1 and 2 Samuel, who waited for God's justice in the face of evil and was delivered over and over and over again. And he tells us in many psalms, Psalm 37 is is a good one, don't fret over the evildoers. Don't be jealous of them. You keep on trusting the Lord. God will not forsake his saints. He will not let go of his people. Or here, Job. Job, he endures this terrible suffering, and he cries out to God, right? He's waiting for this answer. Why am I suffering? Why am I suffering? And you know, he never got the answer. But he was blessed in the end because he tenaciously held on to his faith, and he took his concerns, and he took his anxieties, and his fears, and his questions to God. He was praying, he was waiting, he was praying, he was waiting. And you see how the book turned out in the end? You see the good purpose of the Lord? You see the mercy and the compassion of God? Or think of Jesus. Even on the cross, knew that God was present, and he prayed just before his death, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Quoting Psalm 31. Into your hands I commit my spirit. That's not a cry uh, of despair. It's not some kind of expression of of resignation, but it's confidence in his Father to redeem him from death. And his Father answered that prayer three days later, and he was raised from the dead. And like Jesus, Joseph. Joseph was favored by his father, rejected by his brothers, falsely accused, suffered innocently, went down into the pit, but was faithful all the way, didn't know what was going on, but kept on doing the right thing, couldn't see the big picture, but he did what he could in the moment, serving the Lord with faith, and he was raised up, and he was vindicated, and he ascended to the right hand of the king to reign with authority and mercy toward the people who hated him. 
Why? Because in the end, he believed in God's providence. You meant evil against me, he said to his brothers, but God meant it for good. So providence is something that we can only see in hindsight, after the fact, right? After we've gotten through the storm. And that's why God records these stories for us. Paul says, whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Don't these stories give us endurance? Don't they give us hope? Because look at how these faithful people, look at how their story ended. So what does that mean for you? You stay faithful. And what stories will we be able to tell in 10 years' time, in 20 years' time, in 50 years' time? What people will be converted? What good will be done? Well, we can't answer that, can we? God knows. Well, what do we know? We know that He's working. We know that He's working even now. We know that He's working even now for good. Working for good in all things. Working for good in all things for those who love Him. Therefore, commit your spirit into God's hands. Be humble. Be at peace with God and endure faithfully. I want to read one more verse before we close here. In the book of Galatians, in chapter 6. I know there are some here who are really struggling. In a, in a congregation this size, you know that there are people who are going through something. I know you're going through something. And the admonition is to believe and trust in God and continue doing the right thing. Continue being faithful. Continue doing good works. Look at what Paul says in Galatians chapter 6. He says in verse 9, Let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap, if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Why do we do good? Why do we do acts of mercy and sacrifice? Because we get a thank you from the people we do them for? Very rarely. Very rarely do we get that. We do it because we believe in God's providence. We do it because we believe in the principle of the harvest, that when you plant a seed, God will make it grow. We do it because in due time, In his time, in his perfect time, we're going to reap. So the harvest is coming. Keep working and believe in God's providence. And when we surrender our lives to the God who provides, what benefits to us? You can be freed from the regrets of yesterday. If you would only come to Jesus Christ, commit your times into his hand, You can be forgiven of your sins. You can be freed from the regrets of yesterday and be given new life in Him. You can be strengthened then for the challenges of today, not worrying about tomorrow because you know you don't have tomorrow, but what you've got is right now. That's the gift God has given you, and He's given you resources in Christ Jesus to be strong to face those challenges, whatever those challenges are. Don't think about tomorrow. Think about now. What are you doing now? That's what God wants you to focus on. And you can be safeguarded against the uncertainties of tomorrow. Why? Not because you know what's going to happen tomorrow, but because you believe in a God who's in control. May God help us to be trained by His providence so that no matter what evils come our way, no matter what problems we face in life, we can pray, my times are in your hand. All the way my Savior leads me. It is well with my soul, whatever my lot, right? We've got a whole catalog of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to sing and pray throughout the day. So if you haven't given your life to Jesus Christ and committed your times into his hand, then you can be baptized right now. You can have your sins washed away. You can start with him fresh, and you can walk in him. And if you are a Christian already, and you need to confess something, you need the prayers of this church, you need our our help, and you need to make something known to us and how we can help you in whatever your spiritual need, we ask that you come forward as we sing this song.